Thank you all so much for being here. I'm super excited to jump into God's Word tonight. We're starting a new series called Get Real. And, uh, but before we, go there, before we go there, I just want to say how thankful I am for Pastor Jay Thompson. Amen. Jay, for, yeah, come on now. If you're going to clap, man, you got to clap, right? Don't half-heart this thing. Uh, I, 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 you know, he, 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 is, he may be in his 70s, but, but I, I don't know. I was here last Saturday night, and I'm just thinking that that man still has a little fire in his belly, right? It was awesome. So, preacher man, thank you for uh, coming out of retirement for us, man. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, when I get worn down and beat up, He's going to come up here, and, and I'm going to hand the baton to him, and he's going to do what he did this past week every now and again. And so I always look forward to that. I hope that you will, too. You know, most of the time when the pastor goes out of town or he takes a break for a week, people leave and say, well, that must be my week off, too. Because sometimes there's a letdown in the, in the preaching. That's not the case anymore, right? So, so if I'm not here, Jay's here. Right? Jay's here, so you know it's going to be good. So anyway, we, we're, we thank, thank you for that. So, so um, just so you know, we, we do have a new Facebook thing going here. And, and so what you see here, just to kind of give you an update, um, because you, we talked about our offering and investing eternity and, 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 and the people that are online watching it, they want to hear the message of the gospel too. I hope that you want them to hear it. And so... That's what we're doing. So we're, we're, before it was like one iPad right there in the middle and there was no direct sound and I sounded like I was a mile away and, and if I moved, right, I'm out of the screen. They don't know who they're talking about, you know, whatever. It's just, it was bad, but it was, it was sufficient for the time. But what we've got now, as you can see, I don't know if you see this, see this tripod right here. So there's this, this angle here. There's another one straight on and then there's another one behind Marty. And so there's different angles that are being broadcast and, and, and Tanner can control that from right there and the sound is directly in now, so it's just a lot better sound. And the reason for that is because, you know, first and foremost, the Bible says, how will they know unless they are told, right? Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. So they need to be able to hear it when we preach it. They need to be able to hear it clearly with no distraction. And so this will allow them to hear it better, uh, a better product, so that we can get some folks who are watching it already to start inviting people over their house and they can have church right there in the living room. They might not live here. Maybe they live in Colorado or Kansas or California or other states that start with K. And, and they can have a church right there in their house. And so that's what we want to do because we got to get the gospel out, yo. we got to get the gospel out, right? So this is an effort to do that. So when, when the gentleman came through with those baskets, that's what you're helping to to fund, and so I hope that you're excited about it as we are. Um, like I mentioned, we're going to start a new series tonight called Get Real, A Real Christian Is. You know, I was getting ready for this sermon series, and it dawned on me that this church is not like every church. You know, we, we are very, very, we are a spoiled bunch, right? We're very fortunate because at our church over these last couple of years, we've seen a, a boatload of people uh, walk forward and say yes to Jesus, and we've seen and we've seen the the floors wet with baptism water as people gave their life to Christ and and they got baptized publicly and and so we're super fortunate like that and and you can see t like if you we, uh, Jay talked about fruit last week you can see tangible fruit in the lives of the people that attend this church they they crave God's word you see them they're praying and they're and they're fasting and they're giving and they're serving and when there's something to do here they want to come and learn and taste and see that the Lord is good and they used to be sitting in the seat like this, when is it going to be over? But then you look over now, and they're going like this, worshiping the Lord. Like, you can see change in people, and we're very fortunate to be one of those churches, but it's not like that in every single church. See, the kingdom of God is exploding across the earth. It's up to two and a half billion people now, so Jesus' promise to build his church is pretty solid. He's doing a great job, but it's just not like that, like crazy here in America. It's not flourishing in America. And what started out with the inertia that was in the, col the Christian colonies has kind of slowed down to a, a hardly even moving and, and maybe even 
backing up just a little bit. How many people are familiar with the, with the so-called fact that in America, 70% people in this country claim to be Christians? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Okay, you've heard that. And I, I wish that was the case. There's two research, Christian research firms in this country that are the leaders in doing research for the church, the health of the church. It's, there's the Barna Group, and then there's the Pew, like not Pew, but Pew, research group. Well, recently the Pew Research Group did an extensive study, and this is disheartening, and this should really bother you. I hope that you're bothered when I'm about to say that only 56% of Americans believe in the God of the Bible. That should disturb you greatly. 50, it used to be 70, and we know that's not the case, right? Well, now it's, they claim that it's 56. I don't know about you, but they're a Christian organization. They might be a little bit biased towards leaning towards something favorable. So if it's 56, it's probably not even that. But at best, it is. And why is that? Why is it exploding in other parts of the world like China and Africa and India? In nations that are predominantly Muslim, why, why is Christianity exploding? Yet here in America, it is, it's, it's suffering. And, and every single year, thousands of churches that start out like this one, when, when, when God spoke to a man and said, I want you to start a gospel work and I want you to preach the word with passion and power to your people, and they would flood the place, and then one day they just put a for sale sign. Like, what, why is this happening in America? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And I'd like to kind of go over a little bit why here tonight. Now, before I progress to the next slide, I want to warn you that I'm going to be PG for just a few moments. And it's not because it's going to be sexually explicit or anything like that, but what you're going to see on the screen, it may make your stomach turn. As a matter of fact, I hope that it does. I hope that everything you're about to see here in these next few minutes is going to turn your stomach and make you sick and drive you to a greater passion for the kingdom of God than it's ever been before, okay? So bear with me as I progress through this. Check out this first slide. See if these look familiar to you. Do you have you ever seen these before? Have you ever seen this? God hates Jews. You're going to hell. Look at the bottom. Rabbis rape kids. Fags are beasts. These are real signs, guys. And these are signs that are being held by members of Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas. This is, now listen, listen, listen. Th these people claim to be Baptists, okay? And I, I'm not a denomination guy. You guys know this, right? But I will say that Baptists are Christians. That, that's a Christian denomination. The ones who believe in the God of the Bible. The ones who believe in the Bible. And that church right there, look at the sign. Do you see the banner on the, on the, on the side? GodHatesAmerica.com. Do you know what the name? They've got, other, they've got God Hates Jews, God Hates America. They, I saw another one from their church that says, Thank God for 9-11. And their website is God, listen, you can look it up. GodHatesFags.com. That's their website, man. And these are these are Baptists, supposedly, who are claiming to be Christians. Do you, you ever just stop and think, well, if, if they're Christians, don't they understand the most popular verse in all of Scripture? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. How about Romans 5.8 that says that, that he showed great love by sending his son to die for you while you were anything. List it. Right? So does this make sense? But they're on the news, and they're giving you and your Jesus a rotten name. There's more. How about the next one? You guys know them, right? You know what's disturbing about this? Most disturbing? The background. That's what gets me the most. Not to what they do to people, but what they do to our Jesus. And that should bother you. And so you see, these people, the KKK and all this, the awful, just, they're morons. 
But all this crap that they do, they, they will swear up and down. You can go to their sites online and they will swear up and down to upholding Protestant Christian position and morality. This is what, the, listen, go to the next slide and look at the top line. That's their creed, man. Look at that. I believe in God and in the tenets of Christian religion. Are you kidding me? You know what they do. But they, they swear up and down to Christianity. That Jesus is leading them to do this stuff. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not who a Christian is. Here, here's another group. This, I, th this is awful. Go to the next one. It's a group called Christian Identity. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but look at they quote the scriptures there about Yahweh. That's... That's God's covenant name. That's his name. That's the unspoken tetragrammaton, the one who's so holy you can't pronounce his name. That's who they claim to follow. And this is what it says. It's a, it's a perverted view of Christianity, much like the KKK. They hold this, that all non-whites on the planet should either be exterminated or enslaved in order to serve the white race in the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. This is what they believe, and that only white people can receive salvation and enter glory. This is what they claim as Christian identity. Romans 3.22 says that all can be made right with God by confessing Jesus as Lord, and it doesn't matter who you are, it's available to all people. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, it says it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, a slave, a free man, a, a, an uncircumcised person, a barbarian. It doesn't matter who you are. That's all that matters is Christ in you. And, and so here's, here's the problem. The church of Jesus Christ in our country suffers greatly because there's Jesus and he's rocking and awesome, right? And then these, these buffoons Foons who claim his name and they're misguided people living out some false version of Christianity and the world sees it. So there's those people that are misguided and they live out some false thing. And then there's also this other group of people, these other misguided people that they're the ones that levy standards upon you that God doesn't put on you. They're the, listen, you guys know them. They're the, hey, you, you should be people. You, you should say, you should be. They're the ones who tell you how you should be. These are the ones who, I love, these are the people that came up with this standard. And it sounds good at first. Well, Jesus was perfect. Christians are supposed to be perfect. And, well, you know, the Bible does say that you should be holy, for I am holy. So that's what we should be shooting for, Right? But they do this, you know, people's motivation is what matters. They do this, they say this, just to set us up for failure. So that they can see you when you misbehave and say, see, Christians are just hypocrites. That's why they do it. And we can't live up to that. But listen, here's what a real Christian should claim. That Jesus was and is perfect and that you are not. But yet you're striving and desiring to be like him, but you admit when you fail. You are forgiven of failure, but you are not free of failure. The Bible says we all fail in many ways, right? We're not perfect, but we strive. Who wants to strive for that? I want to strive to be like that, right? See, we're not perfect how many people in this room were conceived of the holy spirit as jesus was not me how many people are coming from a place of deity how many people in the room have stepped off their throne in heaven and come down here to be with your people no one we are flesh being transformed daily into his image that's who we are that's who we are I love it. It says uh, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, in the English Standard Version, this is what it says of this. It says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 
In other words, the mask has come off. And he can see you for who you are. And you can see him for who he really is. That's the, what's the glory of the Lord? It's perfect and full. It's, in, it's not incomplete. It's perfect. And we can see that. That's the goal. And it says the Spirit of God, with that in mind, and that is the target, he is transforming you a little bit. Glory to glory. Not the fullness of the glory, because that's what God has. You don't have that. But every day, a little bit of glory, and a little bit of glory, and a little bit of glory. Put one foot in front of the other. Right? That's what you're doing every single day. So you can become like him. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. And so the only question that you have to have is this. Do you want that? Yes. Do you want that? Yes. Do you want to get real? Yes. Right? Not what, what people would say you should be, but do you want to be what God wants you to be? So all that set up to say this. What is a real Christian? And what is he or she to say and do and act like? What should someone look at and go, that's a Christian. That's a Christ follower. we got to do like Jay said. we got to stop being Christians and we can become disciples of Jesus. We don't have to be someone by label. We should be someone that they look at and go, oh, oh, oh he's been hanging out with Jesus. That's who we need to be. And so I ask you this. All these different places and organizations and people are putting up this false image of what Jesus is and what it looks like to follow him. And I don't want that. See, let me just ask you, if you were going to play for, say, the Patriots, right, would you want Bill Belichick to teach you the plays and the, and the philosophy and the standards of what it means to be a Patriot? Or would you want, like, say, the coach of the Seahawks to teach you Patriot plays and Patriot philosophy? What would you choose? Hello? Belichick, right? You want the guy who's organizing and running the team to teach you, right? That's what I would want. So we turn to God's word to be informed as to what it means to be God's son or God's daughter. Why? Because Christianity, Christianity should never be defined by the failure of its people. It should be def defined by Christ himself. And so we turn to God's word to get our answer. What does it look like to be a real Christ follower? And there's no better place in all of Scripture than the short little letter that Paul wrote to this guy. I call him Philemon. Some of you, I've, I know you call him Philemon. Most of you don't even know who I'm talking about. We're a non-denominational church, so we're going to call him Phil. Right? Because we don't fight about stuff around here. He's Phil. We can all agree to that one, right? It doesn't make any difference what his name was. What matters is what God says in the book. And so we turn to that book to find answers. This is an awesome book because not only does God use Paul to teach Philemon and you and I what it means to be a real Christian. He gives them the, the do this and don't do that routine. But God also uses Paul to model amazing Christian character before Philemon and the reader, us. And so twofold benefit here. So let's do this. Let's, let's read this book. Now, if you don't have a Bible in your hand, you're missing out on the main dish of the night. Don't just come into church thinking I'm going to read it for you. Grab a copy of God's Word and put your face in it. Okay? The page number for the Bibles that are on the table, are up, it's up on the screen. So there's no excuse. You never want to walk into eternity going, Hey, nobody ever told me about that. It's right there in front of your face. Okay? If you guys are ready to go, just say go. All right, Philemon. Phil. I'm going to read the whole thing. Look, it's, a, it's like a half a page long. The whole thing. Pregnant with truth. This letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to Philemon, our beloved... I'll, okay, Phil. I'm writing to Phil, 
our beloved co-worker and to our, and to our sister, Aphia, and to our fellow soldier, Archippus. I'm waiting for someone to name their kid Archippus. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. I'm not having any more children. Did you hear that? From, I'm just... <sighs> this sermon just went so sideways. <laughs> Whatever your will is, Lord. I am writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Aphia, and to our fellow soldier Archippus, and to the church that meets in your house. That's Philemon's house. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God when I pray for you, Phil, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could, I could demand it in the name of Christ because it is the right thing for you to do. But because of our love, I, I prefer simply to ask you. Here it is. Consider this a request from me, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. You know, never forget that Paul's Jewish, and so that he uses guilt. There it is, right? I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past, but now he is very useful to both, to both of us. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I wanted to keep him here with me while I was in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hands. I will repay it. And I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. There it is again. <laughs> I won't even, I love that. And I won't mention what I'm about to mention. He's an awesome preacher. <laughs> yes, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I am confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. One more thing. Please prepare a guest room for me for I am hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark... Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So just kind of overview of this short letter. Paul is writing this letter to Philemon, who has a church in his house. Okay, So he's not just some pew sitter. He's, he's, he's a pastor. You know, you don't have to have a building to be a pastor. They had home churches back then, and they need them now. That's why we're doing what we're doing. I hope you'll keep that in prayer and, and help in that. But he was, the, he was not a pew sitter. He was a, what the scriptures would say, a co-worker, or in some translations, a fellow soldier. Right? He, was, he was getting at this thing called Christianity, advancing the kingdom of God. Paul doesn't call him a fellow soldier because he's sitting there showing up on Sunday morning, saying a few prayers and going home. He is hard at this thing called the kingdom of God. He's probably a wealthy man because he's a slave owner and obviously 
Poor folks didn't own slaves, and apparently this Philemon owned Onesimus as a slave. But as the story unfolds, we can see that Philemon lost something to Onesimus. Onesimus stole something from him. That's why Paul says, I'll pay it back. He stole something from Philemon, and he bolted, but he got Put, he got caught and he got put in jail, as fate would have it, right next to the Apostle Paul. What do you think's going to happen to that guy? He's getting saved, man, right? Paul can't talk about anything else. Even when he's in jail, Jesus is awesome. Let me tell you about him. So he finds himself in jail next to the Apostle Paul, and Paul goes on to say that it's true. My child Onesimus, I became his father here in prison. So obviously not his father, his dad, but a spiritual father, the one who led him to the new birth in Christ. And, and also in verse 19, I joked around about it sarcastically, but look what he says to Philemon also. He says, you owe me your very soul. So that lends us to believe that God used Paul also to lead Philemon to Christ. And so what's happening here is that Paul is leveling the playing field between this wealthy slave owner who had stuff stolen from him from this slave who did the stealing, looked, looked at this guy high in society, right? He's a wealthy man. He's, he's the leader of a church, and here's a slave who's looked down upon in society, the lowest of the low, and Paul is leveling the playing field between the two people in preparation of sending Onesimus back to Philemon, not as a slave now, but literally as a brother in Christ. He, he's telling the, the Christ follower, uh, Philemon, who's like rocking it for Jesus, that, hey, man, you could rock it even better at a higher level than you even are now. You can't, listen, you can't earn more of God's love, but you can produce more fruit for the Lord. And that's what he says here. I want you to be productive in your faith. Now think about that. He's leading a church already. He's pastoring a church. He's a fellow soldier. He's a co-worker in the gospel with Paul. Paul's working. He's operating at a high level for the gospel, right? And Paul calls this guy a co-worker, a fellow soldier. He's like, you're doing like what I'm doing. This is not some lukewarm, show up to church on occasion on Christmas and Easter kind of guy. No, this guy's hard at it and he says, but I want you to be productive. I'm not being productive. Well, he is, but he wants, he's calling him to something higher. And that's what's happening here. Now, listen, I don't know how many weeks this series is going to go. I thought it was going to go maybe two or three, four weeks, but I don't know how long it's going to go. But in this text, I've, I've, in my studies, I've found already like 10 particular characteristics that are expressed here in this short little story, this short little letter that illustrate what a real Christian is. And I'm going to continue to study it as we go, and I'm just going to go until they run out. So I don't know exactly how long this is going to go, but we're going to get into some particular details of what a Christian man or woman should be doing and saying, like what they should be. Okay, so, but before that, before we go into the details, let's just talk like big picture. Let's just back it up and go bird's eye view for a second over this letter and find out the intention of the letter, okay? Just, 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 let's just go there before we jump into the details. The church, the, the church of Jesus Christ is the body of believers. And, and the body functions best when all of its parts are operating at their full capacity, right? We, do, we, do we understand that? Like, no matter what it is, whether it's the church, a company, a sports team, a car, a family, whatever it is, if all parts are really rocking it the way they should be, it operates at its best. Now, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4, 16 that God places us together perfectly. Some translations say this, that Jesus fits and knits the whole body together. He's joining us together as one people. 
Okay? I want to read this, these other verses to you. It gives us an, a clear understanding of what he's doing. How do, we, how do we live together as one? How do we function properly as one effective body on mission for Jesus? If you back up just a few verses in Ephesians chapter 4 and you read the first six verses, it says this. Here's Paul again. He's a prisoner in jail. He says, Therefore, I, a pr Paul, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to, I beg you to, to, to lead a life worthy of your calling. He's calling back to remembrance all that Jesus did for you on the cross and what that means and what it should, how it should pan out in your life as a result of what he's done. There's this amazing thing that happened and he's called you to something more than just a belief. Even the demons believe. And he's called us to something more. If you're a Christian, then you're called to something amazing. And he wants you to, Paul's begging people to live a life worthy of this calling for you have been called by God. He says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit Binding yourselves together. This is what's happening. God's doing this. This is how he's doing it. As he's knitting, this is what he wants us to do. To be knit, to be bound together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. And so how many, keeping this in mind, that we've been knit together as one family. How many people have walked to the altar to receive Christ and said some prayer that they were told to say, but are nowhere near the place with the Lord they should be because of their because their failure and their lethargy goes unchallenged by those who know better and supposedly love them. They're supposed to say something, but they slide back from the table because they're lazy. Because you've, you fear. You're unwilling to risk a friendship or the benefit of that friendship. Hey, if I get on Carl's case, he's got a nice boat. I'm not going to be able to go fishing anymore. And if I get on to Justin or Bonnie, man, they babysit my kids. If I say something about his sin, I might lose my babysitter. Come on now, right? Let's just be real in church. This happens all the time. It's not my problem. I got my own problems. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to offend anybody. I want to be politically correct. It's not my place. Excuse, excuse, excuse. And how much potential is unreached? And how many disasters could be avoided if we'd open our mouths because we love them? There's a verse in Proverbs. It's a parenting verse. It's definitely a parenting verse. But it's so appropriate right here, right now. Proverbs 13, 24 says, you've heard of, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. You've heard of that, right? 13, 24 says it a little bit deeper. The one who will not use the rod hates his son. But the one who loves his son disciplines him diligently. It's, 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 so yes, it's for a child. But, but if you love your child and they're doing something, they're about to crash, right? Engage. That's what it's saying. Engage. You don't have to beat them with the rod, but engage. Like stand up, say something, open your mouth. Sweetheart, you're about to fall off the cliff. I love you. Open your mouth and say something. Isn't that what we do? Diligently, that doesn't mean one time. That doesn't mean you come to the altar, he's saved, that's good, he's going to glory. No, you're failing, something's wrong. I love you too much to watch you fail and fall. So I open my mouth and I say something. And Jesus said his command is to love one another. And so if you love something, if you love someone, what does it say? Diligently, 
engage in their life. We've been knit together as one. I need you to say something to me. I sat with the band that's forming Monday, and I slid across the table a piece of paper that said five moral fences. And these are, these are the, you know, these are the, these are the moral fences that Meredith and I have adopted for my life. Like, if you're a woman, you can't come in my office and talk to me. Do you understand that, right? Yeah. Do you understand that if I'm on the side of the road and it's raining and lightning and my car breaks down and one of you wonderful ladies whom I love stops to give me a ride, I'm not getting in your car. If I die, I'm not getting in your car. Yeah. Do you understand? If I see you on the side of the road, one of you lovely ladies, and it's pouring down, raining and lightning, I wish you luck. I'll call my wife and she'll come get you. You're not getting in my car. There's just certain things. I'm not going to travel alone. I'm not going to put myself in jeopardy. I'm not going to jeopardize this ministry. There's fences that I need in my life. That's why I told these guys, you see this piece of paper? If you see me do anything against this, you need to speak up. Heaven forbid I'm doing something and you know it, you guys, and you don't say something to me and I fail because you didn't open your mouth. And that's the way it is for all of us. We're supposed to help each other, right? We're supposed to help each other. See, when you love somebody, you don't keep your mouth shut. When you love somebody, you, you exhort them and you, and you encourage them to fly higher. And when they're crooked, you speak to them so they can straighten out. That's what we do. And I cannot, you know, some people would, would say, well, 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 the Bible says, because they start quoting scripture at you, because that's, you know, that's what they do. The Bible says, you're supposed to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's my salvation, right? We don't have to, you don't have to tell me what to do. I don't need to tell you what to do. I have to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, absolutely, you need to work out your own salvation. No one can get you saved, except that's the thing between you and Jesus, right? I can't get you saved. But let me ask you a question. Anyone ever go to college? I did. I got a degree in my office on the wall, right? Whose name is on it? Yours? Now, my name's on it. I worked out my own education, but I needed teachers. And I needed books. And I needed other Christ followers to throw things at and get some input and talk and reason and challenge my thinking. That's what I needed. So, I, yeah, it's my degree. It's my salvation, but I'm not working it out on my own. So, absolutely, yes and amen to working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But I would add to it this. 1 Corinthians 5.12 says, It is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. It is our, our, our job and responsibility to go... And listen, that doesn't mean the people are sitting in this building right now. It means that we're supposed to judge the people inside the church. Do you know what that means? It means the ones who are supposed to be living according to this. That's your job. It's your responsibility to speak up and engage your loved ones when they're going to get ready to roll off the cliff. And so that's why I've said before, if you see someone in your church that's stumbling and they're going the wrong direction, chapter and verse, chapter and verse, chapter and verse. Listen, Bethany, I love you, and I want to see you have all that God would have for you, but what you're doing is not according to this verse. Read it. What does it say, though? In Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, it said, Humble, gentle, allowance for fault, not, God hates Jews! God hates fags! What do you, no, no, no. That's not the way you get it done. I mean, that's what it says, right? Humble and gentle. Listen, if someone's sinning, it's bad. I get it. Not, I hate you! Humble. Gentle. We're knit together as family. We're supposed to encourage one another with the word of God. It's God's word that's the fence that we're to live in. It's God's word that should be learned. It's God's word that should be shared. And it's God's word that should be used for one another. That's what it's for. How close to the cliff does a brother need to get before you open your mouth? How, how close to the iceberg does your sister have to get before you open up your mouth and risk it all to help them? I don't know. But that's what we see in this letter. That's what we see in this letter. 
Paul risking the relationship that he's got with this guy to call him to something higher. Willing to maybe risk the relationship. What, what, so, so this guy stole from me. He hurt me. He offended me. He committed some crime against me. And now you're telling me I need to accept him back as I'm accepting you. I should maybe make a room in my house for the guy who stole from me. Yes, that's what I'm asking you to do. I could demand you to do it. But because of the love that we have for each other and the love we have for the Lord, I'm asking you, would you fly higher? And he's risking everything. That guy could definitely say, pound sand, Paul, right? But he's willing to do it so this guy could fly higher. So he could reach his full potential. And, and why, 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 why is Paul doing this? Why is he calling him to this new level? It's because of love. It says, verse 5, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. In verse 9, but because of our love, I'm asking you to do this. Verse 7, your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother. That's why he's doing it. Love for Jesus and love for those that God has fit you together with should compel you to speak life into each other. Both as a preemptive strike before the sin and failure, and then, of course, afterwards as a healing bomb to the sin and failure. But whatever the case, don't be quiet. Speak up in humility, gentleness, and love. So, that's why he's writing this letter. And we can learn a lot from that, to open our mouths and don't be quiet in this world that says you don't talk about religion and politics. Someone, I get grief all the time, but someone has to stand up for God and his word. 56% of the people in America believe in the God of the Bible because so many people that claim to be Christians are acting like buffoons and those that know better are standing quietly by as brothers and sisters fall off the cliff into eternity in hell. That's not cool, man. You have to open your mouth and engage. If you love someone, you discipline them diligently. It's not just for your kids. It's your brothers and sisters in the Lord. So, let's, let's now get into some details here in the book. Let's get real, okay? So a real Christian is this. You're going to see it here. Let's just read the first three verses again. It says that this letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I am writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Aphia, and to our fellow soldier Archippus and to the church that meets in your house. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Listen, a real Christian is a committed Christian, right? There's no such thing as someone who's not committed if you're going to be called a Christian. If you are a Christian, then you are committed to Jesus, like 100% all in. There's no more room in the church of Jesus Christ for the pew sitter, for the one who sits around and does nothing as far as a commitment to the Lord and his mission. Listen, if you're not committed to the purposes of Jesus, you have to question whether you've been saved. You have to question it. Not to scare you, but to tell you it's time to evaluate. Has, has my salvation experience truly changed who I am? Have my priorities changed? Is my perspective different? Or do I still go about life the same exact way? Failure after failure after failure after failure. God's word is proclaimed. Someone shares the word of God with you, encourages you in a different way, and you still hold on to the same thing you did, and you get the same exact results, and you will not change. Paul was a committed Christian. Did you know that Paul was in prison three times? He was, in, he was in prison in Ephesus, he was in prison in, in, in Philippi, and he was in prison in Rome. Now, this is obviously written when he's in prison. He says, I was in chains, I'm in prison for preaching. 
I don't know which place for sure he was in jail when he wrote this letter, but non-biblical resources tell us that he was in Ephesus when he wrote this letter, in jail. But in either case, whether he's in Ephesus or Philippi, it doesn't make any difference. We know for a fact that he is in prison. Why? For preaching Jesus Christ. That is why this guy is in jail. And listen, being a committed Christian is kind of twofold. First, let's look at this spiritually. 1 Corinthians 9.16 says this. Paul said this. I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach. Woe. Now listen, that's kind of weird. He, this, how many people agree? I asked everyone this past week here in the church on, on Wednesday. How many people agree that the Apostle Paul is a saved man? Raise your hand. Definitely going to glory, right? He's there. But yet, he says, woe to me if I don't preach. He's like, I've been called by God, just like we read. I've been called by God to, to live according to my calling. And according to the calling, how do they know unless they are told, right? All of us, not just Paul. And so he says, listen, if, if I don't do as God says to do, woe to me. You know what woe is? Grief. That's how it's translated. Grief to me, like, he's like, hey, listen, I know what I've been told to do by God, and, and I know I'm saved, and I know I'm blessed, and the favor, listen, I was sucked up to the third heaven, I saw stuff you'll never see. But even so, if I don't do what God has called me to do, grief is coming my way. He knew it. He's not looking for God's discipline, like God will discipline you, right, Jay? But he's not looking for that. He's not going about life saying, oh, let me get some more of that discipline, let me get some more of that grief. Like, we have enough of that. And we don't want that. So he's like, listen, I know I need to do this. I know I better say this. This is the fear of the Lord being lived out right before your eyes. This is a guy who knows he's glory bound, who loves Jesus and says, if I don't do what he says, grief is coming my way. Woe to me if I don't. Paul's like, listen, Christ's death and resurrection has called me to action and I better do this or it's not going to be good for me. And we know he's saved. We know he's glory bound. But he even realizes, listen, I have to do what God says to do or it's not going to go well for me in my life. There's also this, you need to know this, Romans 6.16, 6, this is part of being a committed Christian. It says, Whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. See, Paul made a choice. He didn't have to do this, right? He didn't have to. He could deny Jesus if he wanted to. He made a choice to obey Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, go tell people about me. And he's like, listen, I'm saved. I'm going to glory. But listen, I need to tell other people about this guy. Because if not, it's not going to go well for me. So he made a choice to obey Jesus. He made a choice to be committed. He made a choice to be devoted to Jesus. And the second part of being a, 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 a committed follower is not just choosing that, but being willing to receive the results from your choices. Right? The guy's in jail, man. He's in jail. I mean, just think about this for a second. That's all he had to do was shut his mouth. Just shut up. Don't say anything. They, they, they were, all the leaders were saying, hey, don't preach Jesus. Don't do this anymore, right? You do, we're going to beat you. You do, we're going to put you in jail. They told Paul, they told Peter, they told John, they told all those guys. Just shut up. If he would just shut up, the heat gets turned off. That's all he had to do. But he was committed. He was committed. And maybe it's tough. Maybe if you stand up for Jesus and be bold for the word of God, maybe it's not going to go so well. Maybe you're going to have some bad results. And Paul knew, this is why he knew. Acts chapter 20, verse 23, it says that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead of me. God even gave him the heads up. Listen, if you, I called you to preach and I want you to preach and you better preach. But I'm telling you, if you do, you're going to jail. And you're going to get beaten. But commitment said, I'll take jail. He was committed. 
Is this that fluffy message you came to church to hear? <clears throat> Commitment to Jesus means suffering. Commitment to Jesus means sacrifice. Commitment to Jesus means pressure and persecution. Commitment is the willingness to open it, read it, and do it, no matter what the result, because you realize that when you got saved, you got saved and called to something way bigger than your comfort or your nine to five or your little family. That's what you got saved to. <clears throat> you were saved, listen up, you were saved to build Jesus' church. That's the reason you're here. That's the reason why you got saved. Watch this, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Please read it. Go there, please. Chapter 2, 8 through 10. Where, where am I? No, wait, maybe it's 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. Yeah, but I think that's wrong. No, I got it. That's right. That's right. How about this? Um, always remember that Christ, Jesus Christ, the descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. That was a great place for an amen. Hold on. Let's back it up. Let's back it up, church. Okay? I just want to make sure you're all awake. Okay. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering, and I have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. Amen. So, listen, this is it. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ to those God has chosen. Amen. I get it. I get it. I hope you get it. I hope you get your mind off of your nine to five. I hope you get your mind off of your bills. I hope you get your mind off your priorities and your wants and desires. I get Paul. He could not be shut up because he knew what God had called him to do. And he understood that you guys are more important than him. And I understand him, man. I understand him. If you guys rushed this stage right now and tied me down and put duct tape around my mouth, I would rip it off like a woman waxes her mustache and I'd scream Jesus. Amen. If you don't like it, you could text my wife that she gave me permission to say that. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. He understood the suffering, but the benefit of it. I might suffer that you might gain. And that's what we're talking about. Paul's like, listen, guy, you're rocking it for Jesus, but I want you to reach your full potential in Christ. And so I'm willing to say something to you. Yeah, you're doing good, but that doesn't mean it's good enough. Do more. Soar higher. Reach further. Give more. Serve greater. Pray more. Help more. Never enough. Never enough. Paul was a committed Christian. And because of his commitment to Jesus and to this commitment to the mission and his character on display, willing to not just say it's, you know, we, we're supposed to consider others more important than ourselves. You, so, you know that he said that, right? In Philippians, he said that. But a lot of people say a lot of things. <laughs> he lived it. I'm willing to put you above me and I'm willing to be whipped and beaten and put in jail so that you might get saved. That's commitment. And because of his commitment, he, was, he had credibility. He had awesome credibility. Right there, the first thing, I, a prisoner of Christ, that's credibility. And that gives him permission to speak into somebody's life because he is committed. He is committed. You know, the Bible says, don't seek counsel in the, in the ungodly. Did you know that? Don't seek counsel in the ungodly. You know how many people have come into this church over the years? They show up like once every two or three months. They don't put a dime in that basket. They never use their spiritual gift to edify the body. And they walk in here and say, man, you should do it this way. You should leave. How many people are just like doing the backstroke in their sin 
and they come to you and they tell you how you should live your life. Don't take counsel from the ungodly, right? And, and so Paul's a godly man. He's a committed Christian. He, he's willing to, to, to suffer and go to jail so that others could be saved. He's willing to put his, his friendship and all the benefits of the friendship with this guy on the line to see him reach his full potential. He's willing to put that guy first above himself. He didn't just say it. He did it. A real Christian is a committed one. He or she loves Jesus so they obey him no matter what the cost is. And they obey him. And they open their mouths and they speak to a brother or sister in Christ. Not just out of loving obedience to Jesus, but because they actually truly love the other person with a real love. That's what the, the other... That, that, that's what the... That's what the real brother and sister in Christ does. They don't sit back and slide away from the table watching you go headlong into further sin and destruction. They love you enough to open up their mouth so that they, you won't fall and that you'll soar higher and reach your God-given potential. And we're in this together, guys. And Paul sets an awesome example for all of us to engage your brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're done. We're done here in just a moment. We're going to worship. And we're going to pray. But listen, you've got to open your mouth. You've got to open your mouth. If you see me stumbling or falling, I want to hear about it. How many people have blind spots in their life they don't see it? How many people have known someone who's so caught up in sin that when you say, you're doing wrong, they just don't even see what you're talking about? blinded by that sin. And so, so many of us just go, well, that's just what they do. No big deal. We'll catch you when you, when, you, when you fall. We'll catch you when you get back up again. How many of these disasters could be avoided if we'd open up our mouth and speak to the people that we love? Listen, don't be quiet, loved ones. Don't be quiet. Don't withhold the help that is in you for the family that God has knit you together with. Do you understand? You have to open your mouth. Let's do this. Can you guys all stand for, for just a few moments? We're going to get ready to worship our great King. But before we do, I want to pray with you. I feel very, very compelled in this direction to, play, to pray in this way. 1 John 1 9 says that if we would confess our sins, to God that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So that's a promise of God. Now the reason why I mention that verse is I understand that some if not all of us have denied the Holy Spirit sometimes and we've not heed the warnings that he's given us for our loved ones. We see someone on the side of the road, we don't stop. We know someone in our life that's stumbling and falling and we don't say anything. Listen, I'm gonna set an example for you right now. I'm that guy. And if you're that guy, would you just raise your hand? When you haven't spoken, when you know you should have, just raise your hand so God can see it, right? I just wanna pray with you about this. Lord, I, I, I know what it feels like to have failed you and to have failed a brother or sister in Christ when I knew better, but I didn't want to sacrifice of my time. I, I didn't want to, to, to trash our relationship, even though I saw a brother and another brother in Christ at odds. And I didn't want to invade that space because I was friends with both of them. And I didn't want to lose my friendship because I cared about myself more than I cared about them. There's been times I've seen people on the side of the road or at the mall or at the park and I felt compelled of your spirit to go and speak to them and give them the greatest news they would ever receive. And I am stubborn and I was hungry and I was late and I didn't want to be bothered and I neglected that person. Heaven help me 
and I don't do that anymore. And I know I've been that person, Lord, and all of us have. But like we've said so many times, and it's worth saying again, that at some point to be a Christ follower means that your word carries more weight than what we feel. And even though we all feel shame and guilt for being the person who's done this so many times over and over again, we would ask, Lord, that you would 1 John 1, 9 us. We confess by raising our hands that, that we've been that person. But you said in your word that you would forgive us of this and you would cleanse us of all wickedness and unrighteousness. That means all of the shame and the guilt that goes along with our failure would be erased, never thought of by you again, therefore never thought of by us again. Would you help us to, help us to receive that right now, Lord, as we confess that we failed? The good news about the gospel, though, folks, is that you can start afresh right here, right now. And that starting today, we would be a people that God's trying to knit together and place together perfectly and powerfully to be an awesome family of God in this place, in this time, to represent Him well. Not like the, the people who use your name and represent you falsely, but a genuine expression of Jesus Christ in a lost and hurting world. I don't know, Lord, what the numbers are for real. I don't know if it's 56% that believe in you or 20 or 5 or 75. I don't know. Only you do. But I pray, Father God, that you would empower these people right here to be genuine followers of Christ, to express your character to this world so that people can truly see you, that the invisible God would become visible here in us. That's our desire. When you saved us, Lord, you began the process of changing us. And one of the things that you change in every one of your believers is the genuine desire to worship you, to lower ourselves, and to exalt your great son. And so, Lord, that is what we're going to do right now. So, Lord, as we sing to you, as we enthrone you as our Lord on our praises, would you at the same time sing over us and rejoice over us as we sing to you would you sing to us we thank you lord for tonight we praise you in jesus name